May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, for anyone who's seen me pack for a long trip, this will come as no surprise. I am one of those people who likes to be prepared. I pack in two bags, one for my clothing and the other for activities to keep myself entertained on the train or plane or in the car. I'm pretty sure this two category packing system is a carryover from my childhood where my mom must have packed for me this way. I close in one bag and another bag filled with books, games, snacks, and a favorite stuffed animal or two just to keep me busy on a long car ride. Nowadays, the activity bag holds my Kindle, which of course is much preferred because I don't have to decide which books to bring. I have more than I could ever read. And with it, my laptop computer, my cell phone, earbuds for listening to audio books or music, and of course, still a few snacks. So when I hear this parable of the wise and foolish maidens, of those who are prepared and those who weren't, I know that I would like to count myself among the wise who would have their lamps ready and flasks of oil all full before the night of waiting began. But I think today's gospel invites us not to put ourselves or others for that matter into one category of the wise or the foolish, depending on how smug or critical we might feel as we hear the story. I don't think Jesus's gospel message of good news was simply to reassure some of his followers that they were all set spiritually, already on the wedding feast guest list, so to speak, or to put the fear of God into others for whom a change of life was necessary by having them imagine being shut out of the wedding party for all eternity. As we look to the gospel text, we note that some of the maidens were prepared and some were not but everyone fell asleep. The message given at the end of the story is after all, keep awake, not be prepared, or keep alert as this translation says. The preparation isn't the goal, at least not in and of itself. Preparation is the means to something more, something more expansive, seeing. The oil is the substance that fuels and sustains the light, and it's what allows the wise maidens to be able to see the Lord when he comes. The oil allows the lamps to illuminate. But what might this story have meant to the first people who heard it, and what wisdom does it offer us today? The followers of Jesus in the first century were people who expected the return of Christ sometimes referred to as the second coming or the rapture, to happen any day. What were they to think when Christ's return was so delayed? Perhaps they started to doubt. Will Jesus Christ ever return? Perhaps others questioned or mocked them. Where is your God now? Things are as they have been. Or perhaps they started to lose their faith. What does it really matter how we live our lives? The time of reckoning is not yet upon us. The excerpt from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians describes vividly this return of Jesus Christ and what will happen to those already dead from their community and to them at that time. Paul advises this community to in the meantime live in hope, to have courage and to encourage one another and support one another in anticipation of Christ's return and all things being raised up in him. Take heart, live now in hope and be sustained by Christ's love and help one another to do so too, he seems to say. And this is certainly one valid way to read and interpret today's gospel message as a word of encouragement to the first followers and to us to keep our faith. Christ coming again may be at any moment, and we best be ready to meet the Lord, for we know not the day or the hour. And true, none of us knows the exact time we will be called back to God for our final resting place. But I believe this gospel story of the maidens and their lamps has even more to teach us. Its message is not limited to living 
life in and for the love of God as we anticipate our death. It shares a message about being awake to witness God's presence in every moment of our lives. We might think then, what does it mean to have our flasks of oil spiritually full? This Friday morning, I got up early before it was even light. I had had one of those strange dreams whose emotions linger and are hard to shake. Not having had much downtime lately and rationalizing that before the change in daylight savings time, it would really be 5.30 a.m. anyway, I decided to get out of bed. I love those times of quiet in a still house before the day begins. The whole world feels peaceful. I sat in my living room and did very little. I drank my tea and patted my cat as she lay on the floor beside me. When I went to boil the kettle for my second cup of tea, sunlight was starting to fill the sky. The view from the kitchen window to the backyard was so breathtaking that I went and opened the drapes in the bedroom and roused my husband with the words, look, it is so beautiful. The deep fuchsia pinks and honeyed purples silhouetted the tree branches in pitch black. I'm sure there are many days when the sky is equally as stunning, but I'm distracted, consumed with my thoughts about what's just happened or what might or could or may happen. I know there are moments when a friend or family member or coworker needs my time or attention, but I'm a bit too frenzied to give them all they deserve. And there are times when I go to pray, but instead my mind churns through a to-do list or my heart is in a tangle from something happened earlier in the day. Truly there are as many ways to not have oil for our spiritual lamps as there are ways to occupy each moment of our days. There are many ways to be off at the market when the Lord is near. Our whole country, it seemed, this past week was glued to a screen showing a map of the country with states marked red or blue. News and social media lamented the struggles of our day, racial conflict and global pandemic hitting closer and closer to home, to name a few. And for weeks we have been bombarded with doomsday scenarios from all manner of political perspectives. I heard the story of one child who asked her parent this weekend, mommy, when are you going to be done watching the map show? Even as someone without children of my own, I wondered the same, when will this election come to an end? And here in the church at St. Albans, we too are in a transition of clergy leadership we might long for days once familiar that are now past or fixate our sights on the future, waiting, wanting to rush ahead to a time that is not yet. But the truth is, it is in this moment that we meet our living God in whatever is happening. God is here always and makes his presence known when we are most hurting and full of grief or when we are overjoyed and full of gratitude and also in those seemingly ordinary moments where not much seems to be happening. How do we keep our oil flasks filled? What is it that fuels and sustains us spiritually? Are questions worth pondering for each of us? One thing the election revealed is how deeply divided we are in all sorts of ways. There is much work to be done in love and with hope for the good of our beloved country. We are not living in an easy time, if there's ever an easy time. We need to sustain ourselves and one another. We need oil for our flasks, not just for the sake of being prepared, but so that God's activity in our lives can be illuminated now. In God's revelation in the morning sunlit sky set ablaze, in our families and friends, loving eyes gazing into ours, and in the innumerable, seemingly everyday moments of our lives where God already and forever is. Hear the invitation. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Yes, let us awake and see. Amen.